So we'll be taking questions from the audience here and also hopefully from the webcast uh, participants. Um, now I'm told that uh, for acoustic reasons, people at the back of the room have difficulty hearing questions that are coming from uh, the audience, from the microphones. So I will try to recap uh, questions as they're asked, and I would ask you to, to please be succinct. So let's begin. Um, my name is Chan Kudinek. Um, recently, I saw a um, documentary uh, on um, farmers in India who committed suicide because they could not have enough money to buy fertilizers. Yeah. And this is um, a huge problem. We are fighting a huge missionary, like you say, the agribusiness. Um, we are you know, very small in this whole um, scheme of things, which is uh, all about money. And um, what suggestions do you have uh, for us, um, the, uh, the people who are here tonight who are actually uh, conscious and aware and want to do something and make a difference? What suggestions do you have for us to create this awareness? Uh, how do we move the power of these uh, very strong, big Monsantos and so forth. So the question is, uh, what suggestions do you have uh, to help uh, build awareness and uh, shift the power dynamic of the big corporations? Yes, uh, uh, the farmers getting in debt in India is a very big problem. And uh, my friend Bandana Shiva, who works in India with the farmers, she knows about this much better than I do. But also, I also know that uh, something like 150,000 farmers in the last 10 to 15 years have committed suicide, suicide because of the debt that they cannot pay back. And uh, so this debt culture has to be questioned. And why should farmers should be persuaded to take loan? Farmers don't need any loan. Farmers have land, they have skills, they have hands, they can sow the seeds. They don't need Monsanto's uh, genetically engineered seeds. And also, when you have GM seeds, farmers become more or less captives or more or less enslaved by the big multinational five or six corporations. And you, in, in, once you start taking those seeds, you cannot save those seeds. The normal seeds, you have a crop, you harvest your crop, and say 10% of the crop you save as your seed for next year. You are not dependent on any big companies to supply seed for you. You don't need any money. You sell your crop to get your money, but you don't need to buy anything uh, like seeds from any corporation. But when you are buying uh, genetically engineered seeds, then those seeds cannot be reused. This is a big problem of those GM seeds. And so you become sort of in the hands of those big corporations. And so Bandana Shiva has been campaigning against Monsanto and all the other uh, multinational corporations who are controlling seeds. And the saving seeds should be the primary responsibility of every farmer and every grower. So you grow your harvest, you take your harvest and save your wheat or rice or potatoes or beans or peas or whatever you are growing, save your seeds, your own seeds, and do not become dependent, particularly if you are a farmer and you need a lot of seeds. You are not a small gardener and you have other income and the gardening is only a little icing on the cake for you. So you have plenty of other income and you can buy seeds. But for a farmer whose main income is the crop and if he or she becomes dependent on both seeds, that is 
very, um, very negative uh, approach. And so saving your seeds and not allowing, not promoting multinational corporations, particularly those who uh, produce GM seeds, uh, and, and not becoming uh, slaves in their hands. That's the challenge. How we do it? It's a big question. We have to raise awareness. We have to communicate. We have to campaign. And Vandana Shiva and many, many other uh, organizations like the Soil Association uh, in uh, England, but there are many organizations in Japan, in Australia, in, I'm sure uh, you have some here as well, uh, and, and the Kaduri Farm, you can find out more from there. So uh, you have to raise awareness. And when large numbers of people become aware that this is a big problem for farmers, and if they become indebted, and the idea of getting in debt, I mean, America is in debt, England is in debt, um, Greece in debt, every country becoming in debt, farmers in debt, uh, business people in debt. This debt culture only benefits the banks who, who take a lot of interest from you. And so minimizing your debt and maximizing your self-reliance on your food, especially. And with agriculture, I would also say that we also need some uh, crafts or arts or other sources of income for the farmers so that they have a little bit of cash income as well, <coughs> side by side, so that they are completely uh, dependent on uh, growing food. But when out of season, when the harvest is done, you have time. My mother used to be a farmer and uh, she had five acres of land and uh, when the uh, harvesting was done and we had all the food in the house and then she had time, so she will do some embroidery. And also my father did some other business uh, as well. So uh, adding something else with your uh, growing food will bring some income so that farmers don't get into debt and, and forced to commit suicide. So that is another aspect of, uh, for the farmers. But raising awareness is our challenge. And we must all uh, spare some time to work in this field. Thank you. Now we have a question from Ling in France, and the question is, Arnie Ness, yeah. the founder of Deep Ecology, said in his 80s, all my life I have believed that logic, rigor, argument is important, but now I realize that emotion is what really matters. So what do you think of this comment? How do you think feelings and emotions can help in conservation? And quoting Vandana Shiva, how can we make people feel the pain of violence against nature and the joy that comes with healing it? Yes. Some of you who may not have heard of Arne Nest, I think he is someone uh, worth looking into and pursuing and finding out. He was the founder of Deep Ecology Movement. He was a professor uh, of philosophy in the University of Oslo, Norway. And uh, he was a teacher at Schumacher College. Uh, so I knew him very well. And I totally agree with uh, Arne Ness and Vandana Shiva that uh, our relationship with natural world is not only a rational, empirical, intellectual, scientific relationship. It is rational, empirical, scientific, but also it is emotional. So unless we develop our emotional intelligence and, and we have some kind of eco-intelligence, and the eco-intelligence and emotional intelligence comes from your heart. And I talked about it yesterday, that we have to develop our heart qualities. So you need, uh, with deep commitment, uh, intellectual commitment, you need deep experience. Deep ecology is uh, pursued and followed and, and developed by deep experience. Now, how do you get deep experience? You get deep experience by being in nature and knowing nature, being in relationship with nature. So, it cannot come only by reading books or only by watching uh, uh, um, nature on television screen, even if it's a wonderful film made by somebody like David Attenborough. 
but that is a second hand knowledge. The first hand of knowledge and experience of nature can be had only when you are in nature. So deep experience and out of deep experience comes deep commitment that what you are experiencing, your relationship with nature, that must not be destroyed for some commercial or some human uh, vested interest. They should be there for its own intrinsic value. The value of earth and trees and plants and animals are not only in terms of their usefulness to humans. Nature has intrinsic value. That is the fundamental and the first principle of deep ecology. So if we recognize the intrinsic value of nature and have deep experience and a deep commitment to, uh, to, uh, in, to maintain the integrity of nature, then I think we can develop heartfelt relationship, more emotional intelligence and, and more eco-intelligence. So that is the way, deep experience. Thank you. Angus. Um, you talk about farmer's dignity. Um, I think there is an um, interesting uh, situation that we observe. Um, when we see um, people working in the city uh, or living in the city, when they go back to um, become a farmer, like university professors, when they retire, they go back to become a farmer. They're actually looking for their personal dignity. Personal? Dignity. 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 Dignity, yeah. Um, um, but when we, as you, following what you just mentioned, following your, what your logic, uh, work to work with soil is actually like a um, spiritual meditation. So when we, when we work with farmers in rural areas, every day they work with dirt, every day they work with soil. But what you just mentioned is they actually lost their dignity at the same time. So I just wonder uh, why such um, situation is happening. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the question is so that... Uh, what I mean is um, dignity should come from inside rather than social recognition. Because yeah. people living in the city, when they go back to become a farmer, they're actually looking for their personal dignity, which yeah. I think is from the inside. Yeah. I'm just recapping for people who can't hear you. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so the question is, people who go from the city to the farmland uh, to reconnect with the soil do so for the sake of their dignity. Um, but the, the farmers, um, they, they've lost their dignity. And, and why is that the case when, when one can have such a spiritual connection with the soil? Um, doing it every day. It is true that dignity comes from within, your own self-dignity. But we are not isolated selves. We are not disconnected selves. We are connected with our culture, with our society, with our environment. We are influenced. We are uh, we have impact of social conditions and we are conditioned by those social conditioning. And so if uh, our culture lifts the industrial production at a higher level and scientific progress and technological progress at a higher level and farming, gardening or tribal indigenous way of living at a lower level that over a long period of time, conditioning of the mind will develop in such a way that people will start to think that living in big cities, in high-rise buildings, is more advanced, more progressive, and being a tribal person, an indigenous person uh, in uh, Aboriginal culture in Australia, or in China, or in um, uh, Native Indians in, in South America, uh, that's a backward. In the same way, farmers, they are backward, they are uneducated. So social conditioning also impacts our self-respect. 
So although I agree with you that dignity comes from within, but it's not disconnected from our social uh, and cultural conditioning. And at this moment, social cultural conditioning is such that we think that doing anything with your hand is somehow not so dignified. Either it should be done by machine or it should be done by some cheap laborer. So what is happening in Europe now, uh, all the jobs are being uh, outsourced to China or to Vietnam or to Korea because we think that all cheap labor in China should produce our uh, goods like radio, <coughs> computers or whatever, shoes, clothes, everything should be produced by cheap labor. They can be paid something small and we can get cheap goods. So they have lost that dignity of labor in themselves. And, uh, and that has to be changed. So we need to bring back in our culture and decondition our social cultural conditioning against growing food or producing uh, material goods like shoes or radio or computers. Why not? If we use it, we should make it. Why should we made by some cheap market in Korea or China? Why not in Germany or England or America? So outsourcing of jobs has the same problem. So dignity comes from within, I agree, but it also connected with the cultural and social conditions. Thank you. So now we have a question from Spencer in Hong Kong. Honestly speaking, I cannot see that people these days will wake up easily to the values of soil and human development and society. Are you optimistic that all of us will be able to treasure the dignity of soil? Do you think people need a big lesson in the form of a disaster or war or something that will upset all human beings? I hope we can wake up before a big disaster hits us. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm optimist because I have a great belief in um, humanity. And I think we are uh, a little bit brainwashed in our culture at this moment. And we are conditioned to think that uh, um, uh, someone will produce food for us. And someone, somewhere, will produce all the other things that we need. And I don't need to do anything. This kind of conditioning, either machine will make it or some cheap labor will produce it. This kind of thinking is prevalent, but this is not going to be here forever. And, and the human conscience and human uh, awareness can be aroused. So I work in hope and with optimism because pessimism is disempowering. If you are pessimist, then you feel powerless. So I, nothing can be done. Either some disaster will come and, and will wake us up, or nothing can be done. That's very pessimistic and disempowering. If that is the done, then you do nothing. You don't need to come to this meeting. I don't need to speak. I don't need to write. I don't need to gar do gardening. I don't need to do anything. Someone, God will save us. That's the kind of uh, hopelessness that I don't like. I'm an optimist, and this is why I'm trying to speak to you and I hope you share some of these ideas. If you do, you will speak to 10 other people. So if uh, 200 people here go out and speak to 10 other people, there will be um, 2,000. And if 2,000 people speak to 10 other people, there will be 20,000. And if 20,000 people speak to 10 other people, there will be 200,000. So we can build a movement, a big movement, in the same way as the movement for civil rights, Martin Luther King built in the United States and Nelson Mandela and his um, organization built in South Africa and around the world to bring an end to apartheid and the Berlin Wall came down and uh, that consciousness was changed. So many, many big changes have taken place in the past and that gives me optimism that if apartheid can come to an end, Berlin Wall can fall down, British Empire can come down, I mean, Hong Kong was a British colony, and Britain was so powerful. Where is that British power now? India was a British colony, but now India is free. So if all those things can happen in the past, 
that history, those examples, give me optimism and hope. And therefore, let's work together and bring back our connection with nature, with soil, with food, and have a joyful, wonderful life of dignity. Thank you again, Satish, uh, for your time. My question is going to be about choices of food that you make. Yeah. And those choices, like when we have the discussion around whether we are vegan, vegetarian, or eating meat, and when you start asking questions about whichever choice you've made there, and starting to realise the craziness of our food transport system when organic vegetables may be coming from New Zealand, sustainable fish from uh, the US frozen and what got me was when there was the uh, air traffic was closed down in Europe our local shop couldn't get organic sausages because they were air freighted from Europe yeah. when you're traveling and away yeah. from home yeah. how do you make some choices around the food you eat which is kind of the choice that I might be making each day at work is where I'm coming from is like how do you choose what you uh, enrich your body with such pain. So, yeah. <laughs> so the question is about the food system and uh, transportation of food and when Satish is traveling uh, how does he make choices about uh, what food to eat? Um, when I'm traveling it is not easy. Uh, one choice I have made whether I'm traveling or staying at home is eating only vegetarian food. That limits a number of problems already. Because if it's a vegetarian, that means you are not participating in the factory farms of animals, and cruelty to animals, and slaughtering in a cruel conditions, all that. And uh, when you are vegetarian, also this problem with, uh, at this moment, big problem, I think, particularly in China, and Hong Kong as well, maybe, the uh, overconsumption of wild animal food. Uh, I'm told that there's a lot of uh, wild food is very fashionable in uh, China, and therefore um, people are going into the wild and collecting all that food, uh, of even snakes and, and, uh, and all kinds of wild animals. Uh, if you become vegetarian, then you reduce that. I do not say that everybody will become vegetarian. The, the second choice would be reduce your meat consumption. Uh, this idea that we need so much meat is a large extent propaganda by the food industry that we need so much protein. I was in a primary school in Darlington when I was organizing Tagore Festival. Uh, I wanted the school to participate in it. So I went to speak to them uh, about Tagore. And one of the child asked me a question. It was only seven or eight year old child. Said, what is your favorite animal? I said, elephant. Said, why? I said, elephant is vegetarian, and yet it becomes so big. So, idea that meat can, only meat can give you enough energy and uh, otherwise you don't get energy from vegetarian food is complete myth. My family has been vegetarian for something like 1500 years and, uh, and uh, Jain family, the Jains don't eat meat and I am, can you guess how old I am? I'm 75 years young. <laughs> and I have never, never, never tasted meat or fish in my life. Do I lack energy? <laughs> Horses are vegetarians. Do they lack energy? So I would say first choice we need to make is to reduce our meat consumption. The second choice I make when I'm at home in England, 
I never, never shop in a supermarket. I always go to a farmer's market or a small supplier of organic food. Most of our vegetables and fruit I grow myself, so I don't need to buy, but for other things like flour or lentils or other honey or oil, other ingredients I need. So I shop in a small shop. And a small shop, a boutique shop, is a much more joyful and a pleasant place to shop than a supermarket where you are nobody. When you go in a small shop, you talk to the shopkeeper. You are friendly. They want you to buy something from them. And you want to please them. There's a kind of relationship. And I talked a lot about relationship last night. So shopping becomes a pleasant experience rather than take, 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 take this, take this, full of uh, trolley, take home, half of it is wasted, half of it is packaging. So second choice I make for myself is never to shop in supermarkets. And the third choice I make is as much as possible, and it's not 100%. Let's not think that we can create 100% utopian ideal and live a utopian ideal 100%. We must always make our journey towards uh, a better, more decentralized, more local system. So I try to uh, buy organic in my choice and I try to buy as much as possible local. So these are the choices I make. Uh, but everybody have to make their own choice. There is no one blueprint for everybody. As long as you are aware, you are mindful, you are thinking about your food and where it is coming from, how it is uh, packaged, how it is transported, how it is managed, how it is grown. All these questions are in the back of your mind. I'm sure every one of uh, us and every one of you are intelligent and wise and with your own wisdom, you will make a right choice. So there's no blueprint. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question from mainland China from Tree Hugger. Ah, in mainland China, Tree Hugger. <laughs> there are tree huggers in mainland China. <laughs> I have a question about the Chipko movement. Yes. The local women played a more pivotal role than men in the Chipko movement. What do you think is the reason for this difference between the genders, besides the fact that deforestation affects the livelihood of women more directly? Yes, yes. Now, many of you may not have heard of this uh, uh, Chipko movement. And again, my friend Bandana Shiva was very much part of that movement. It happened because a big company got licensed from the government to go and cut down a huge, big area of forest in the Himalayas, just north of Dehradun uh, in the Himalayas, on the way to a um, very holy place of pilgrimage where the, uh, the Ganges originate. The source of the Ganges that way was the forest, and the teak forest. And they wanted to make some um, uh, this cricket um, bats or something like that. And so, when the women heard about it, they said, forest is our livelihood. We cannot allow this big company to come, with all these big tractors and so on. So, they said, what should we do? But they had not, not organized anything. They did not know what to do. So, simple thing, they decided. Somehow, it came out of, in a kind of inspired moment. And somebody suggested, that we are going to go and hug the trees and say to these chainsaw um, uh, tree cutters that before you cut down the tree, you have to cut our bodies. And everybody thought, that's what a brilliant idea. And so the women said, men thought, oh, you, they, are not, they are going to pull you away and do that, this or that. Say, but they won't touch women. Because in Indian culture, you don't touch women unless you know the woman, your mother, <coughs> your wife, your sister. You don't touch an alien or somebody, a woman you don't know. So you stay at home, men folks, and look after children <laughs> for a change. 
and we will go women and we have the trees but we cannot allow this big company to cut down our forest hundreds and hundreds of trees and teak wood very valuable beautiful and very important a source of livelihood for the forest people and so that was the reason because men the, the, the chainsaw people will not touch women unless they know them became a very important uh, point to inspire women to lead the movement and these people came and women said before you cut the tree you have to cut us and tree after tree after tree and the moment any tree was empty and if somebody went for a chainsaw the women would rush to it and hug the trees and so for a whole week these people who came with the chainsaw could not cut a single tree and the news spread and then Bandana Shiva was there she's very sort of uh, good at uh, publicity and, and contacting the press and, and, and so on so she spread the word Lucknow, New Delhi, Mumbai, Calcutta, radio, television, Chipko and we, it was every, uh, in every newspaper and every radio station so suddenly it became such a big movement and then a delegation of men went from the area to the local government and the central government in the end that order which license was given to this company was withdrawn and the women had the victory of saving the forest. So that was this story. Beautiful. Uh, yes. Hi, Dr. Kumar. Um, Hong Kong is one of the worst offenders when it comes to consuming locally grown produce. Something like 90% of the food in Hong Kong is imported across all categories. Meat, dairy, fruit, vegetables, and Hong Kong ranked ninth on numerous food vulner vulnerability index last year. So I'm wondering, you know, given that Hong Kong has very limited land, what are some practical ways that we can achieve a better balance? I mean, obviously it's not realistic to expect 100% local you know, local consumption, but what are some practical ways that we can actually improve this balance? Is the best solution simply sourcing more from southern China? Um, you know, because there are certainly food safety issues in China that's, you know, there are problems there as well. So I'm wondering what suggestions you might have, um, you know, within Hong Kong's borders. Um, Hong Kong's very vulnerable. 90% of the food comes from outside. And uh, what are some practical ways that we can redress this balance? Yeah. Um, yeah, it is a real question. And it's difficult to think immediately how uh, Hong Kong can begin to be more self-reliant locally, with local, uh, locally grown food. <clears throat> but if your consciousness is there, and if you begin to think, you will find that uh, any areas now empty of buildings can be protected for growing food. The, the growth of buildings has been non-stop more or less for a long time and I think now Hong Kong and the surrounding area uh, including New Territory have perhaps enough buildings unless they are really essential I think we should try to do the amount of buildings we have today enough and not build more new buildings and more new infrastructure. So see how much land you can reclaim within, uh, within sure. your city and within your uh, various islands. So that will be one step. Small step, nevertheless, at least your consciousness is that way. Um, I don't know what the food issues and safety issues are with southern China, but I would like to find a way so that uh, transportation of uh, uh, miles and the distance uh, of miles is reduced. If you have food miles, which are 10,000 miles or 5,000 miles or 2,000 miles, if you can reduce them to 200 miles or 100 miles or 50 miles, that from the point of view of environment is better. I would like to say that um, if, you, if your waste is reduced, your consumption will be reduced. At the moment we are importing a lot of food from far away and we are not even using it. A lot of food is being wasted. 
even in Hong Kong. So reduce your waste. And, and as I said, Kaduri Farm and base other farms which are already there, talk to them and see how we can, we can participate a little bit in a voluntary basis. Uh, so if people go and touch the earth, touch the soil, uh, know about the seeds, uh, the seasons, all of that, that knowledge itself will connect you with natural world. So without hoping that you can become 100% self-reliant on your food and achieve such ideal, say step by step, the Great Wall of China was not built in one day. Step by step, brick by brick, stone by stone, day after day, after a long period, the Great Wall was built. So if you want a transformation and a change from 60-80% uh, of food imported from New Zealand or Europe or America or something far away, if you want to reduce that and focus on reducing your food miles and, and making as local as possible, that where there is a will, there is a way. You will find some ways. Make a step in the right direction. And there is no destination. There is no final goal. We are always unfolding. We are always um, uh, emerging. New ideas will emerge. New ways of growing food will emerge. Even rooftops can be gardens. Uh, in Kajuri Farm, if you go and see, even I saw one, uh, one of your truck had a, a roof with, with uh, some greenery on it and strawberries growing on the roof of a truck. Can you believe it? So you need imagination. You see why I say, where is the will, there is a way. If you give your imagination and you make a step in the right direction, you will discover many, many good ways of producing food on your roof gardens or any empty space available or local farms where you can go and participate and grow some food. Thank you. And uh, so I will add that we do run courses at the farm uh, to help you learn how to grow vegetables on your balconies, on your window boxes, and you can sign up to those courses on the website. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have a question from uh, Dong Liu in Botswana. Botswana. And I hope that I'm getting this question right. Uh, I'm always thinking about how I can protect our home. If we want to stop destroying the earth, we need to stop using all this science and technology and change our human civilization. Dr. Kumar, if we do that, then thousands of years of, of the work of our ancestors will, will be in vain. Um, do you think that's too big a price to pay? Yes. Good question. What I'm saying does not involve undoing of all the progress in technology and science we have made. We don't need to undo all that. What we need to know is use our wisdom and wisdom is in short supply in our world today. So we need to develop some wisdom, say, what is the right kind of technology? What is the right kind of progress, which is not damaging the earth and not replacing human uh, dignity? That's all we need to be discerning. Now, I would like to say that the agricultural uh, technology, agribusiness, agri-industry, that has gone in the wrong direction. And what we have achieved is no great achievement. We have destroyed our family farms, we have destroyed our skills, we have destroyed our poetry, we have destroyed our celebrations, we have destroyed our festivals, we have destroyed thousands of years of culture and gone into this very narrow agribusiness and industrial agriculture. Whereas traditional farming of thousands of years of ancestral development we had inherited was full of festivals and joy and, and preservation and cultivation and skills and tools. So this technology has undone thousands of years of achievement. So we need to uh, think what are the technologies which are good. 
any technology which aids to human hands, as I said, is a good technology. <coughs> it makes work easier. And if it is based on natural resources, sun, enough energy coming from the sun, the wind, the rain, our muscle power, great source of energy. Seven billion people have 14 billion hands. So much energy in our body. We are not using it. We are all depending on oil, Saudi Arabian oil or coal, deep mining. So we need to think with wisdom. What are the technologies which serve human need without destroying our environment, our ecology? If we can use that wisdom, then science is welcome. Technologies are welcome. Mahatma Gandhi, E.F. Schumacher, they were not against technology. But this mad pursuit of technology to make bigger and bigger profit, minimize human input and maximize technological input. So uh, I'll give you one example. I, uh, when I go from Devon in England to London, I arrive at a Paddington station. Now, Paddington station has a shop called W.H. Smith. It's the stationery, newspapers, books shop. Now, I like to buy, when I'm in the train, I like to buy a newspaper to know what's going on in the world, so I go and buy a Guardian. I used to go there, there were three people serving the customers. Now, three people were getting employment there, they were getting work. Recently, I went to that W.S. Smith shop, and there was one person the two machines. And you, whatever you are buying, newspaper, there's a barcode. So you put your barcode under this machine, and machine will tell you how much the newspaper is, and then you put your visa card or something or cash in the machine, and so self-service. Now, you can say this will be profitable for W.S. Smith, because now W.S. Smith has to pay two people no salary. Now, is this a good technology? Do you want to see two people unemployed on the door queue? Do you want to pay more taxes to the government so that these two people can be kept on door? We have something like one million young people in Britain unemployed. We have something in certain areas, 9, 10, 11% of people unemployed. And these big, big corporations are going for big, big invention of machines, which will replace these people. And then they say, oh, these people are going for riots. These people are not doing any work. Why they should depend on the state? What are they going to do? Either their jobs have gone to China, or to Korea, or to Vietnam, or Bangladesh, or their jobs have gone to the machines what the human beings are going to do. So that kind of technology, which replaces human imagination, human creativity, human input, is not a good technology. So create technology. Science is good. Technology is good if it aids the human creativity, the human work, and makes it more enjoyable and more celebratory. Then it's a good technology. So at the moment, technology is a servant of money. Profit, maximizing profit and minimizing human input. That is the formula of the current capitalist system. So we need to challenge that system. This is not science and technology. It's a pure profit motive, maximizing the profit. So uh, I think we are not undoing the achievement of our scientists and technologically minded people. We are celebrating them, but we are not allowing the science and technology to serve just the capitalist interest of few and not the majority of people. If, we, if science and technology serves everybody, that science and technology is welcome. Thanks. Question from the audience. It's actually two questions. Um, the first question is regarding the example you call um, that the people, the Scottish, buy the bottled water from France and then France people buy bottled water from Scotland. So this um, situation is very much related to the brand name of the product. 
and a lot of the people have a desire for imported product, which is associated, associated with brand name. So how do you think this kind of concept is developed, and how would you have any suggestion how we can decode this kind of I mean, impression? So this is the first question. Uh, the first question is about uh, transportation of, of in, in particular, thinking about the bottled water uh, from Scotland and uh, how people uh, buy things because of a brand name. And, and, and why, why is it that, that brands have become so important and how can we uh, eliminate that, that issue? That's question number one. Um, so the second question is regarding the power of advertising. Um, today, a lot of the want is created by advertising and it is a very powerful channel. And there is actually one activist in Hong Kong promoting people um, try to counter this kind of force by whenever you saw, for example, when you are on train and you saw some advertising show at the train, um, they just encourage people to block the band name so that um, it's kind of like stopping people to look at the brand. So how do you feel about this kind of action and do you have any suggestion for how we can counter this kind of advertising power? So the second question is about the power of advertising and how we can uh, deal with that. I think, uh, <laughs> I think uh, first one is the question and the second one is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> what attracts us to brands is advertising. Advertising is created in such a way that it creates desires. Now, if you live in a Buddhist country, like, like China used to be, <laughs> or a Taoist country, like China used to be, <laughs> then minimizing your desire and attachment and maximizing your well-being was the principle. My friend E.F. Schumacher wrote an essay called Buddhist Economics. He said, economics without values, without moral, spiritual, ethical principles is not economics. Economy must be balanced with values. What are the values of advertising? to maximize your desire and minimize your well-being. <laughs> Just the opposite. So the problem of brand popularity and people getting this desire to have something from far away, something exotic, something new, something they have not tried before, is a desire. And I think desire is endless bottomless. There is no fulfillment of desire. So all spiritual traditions and all wisdom traditions from anywhere in the world, whatever name you might call it, they all have spoken about minimizing desire and maximizing peace of mind, maximizing your well-being. The latest issue of resurgence which Andrew showed you is all about well-being. The economic growth Advertising with economic growth. Economic growth is a second problem to create these uh, desires. Because government and business, they always say that economic growth, economic growth, economic growth, that is the aim of our society. China has 8%, 10%, 11% economic growth. And when in Britain now economic growth is going down, they are all worried. And they are saying, go and shop. We need more consumerism. Government is promoting it. When there was a 9-11 in the uh, United States of America, in New York, what Bush said to people, what was his advice? Go and do shopping. And we will deal with terrorism. Don't worry. Don't stop shopping. So advertising on the one hand, and the goal of increasing unlimited economic growth on a finite planet on the other hand. We are told by people like Bush, 
that shopping is your patriotic duty. <laughs> if you are not consuming and not uh, shopping, you are not a patriot. You are not helping the economy. At Christmas time, when Jesus Christ teaches the live in simplicity, elegant simplicity, that's the Christian tradition. When you become uh, a Christian, you take a, a vow of simplicity, voluntary simplicity. But at Christmas time, it's the biggest time for consumerism. So, I'm afraid this brand attraction is promoted on the one hand by advertisers, and on the other hand, our capitalist system of government and business. So these both have to realize that it's a finite planet and desires, increasing desires, like if you have a little scratch and you scratch it, it will only hurt you more and your skin will be exposed. So when you are scratching your, if you get a scratch on your skin, put a little ointment and put a little bandage and don't touch it anymore. But desires are like that. The most, more desire you need, more desires you have. So, so the answer to your question, both questions are related, is to pursue a more ecological, spiritual wisdom path of joy. Joy and delight and happiness are not related with consumerism. <coughs> joy and delight and happiness are part of our wonderful living, this gl glorious world that we have today uh, around us. The sun is shining, the flowers are blossoming, the fruit is on the trees, and, and the birds are flying, and the children are being born, and mothers are loving, and husbands and wives are, are caressing and kissing and embracing each other. That is a human life, which we have a natural, ecological, spiritual life. That is where the joy and delight and fulfillment Satisfaction is come from that kind of life. Shopping and consuming does not bring satisfaction, does not be, bring fulfillment, does not bring well-being. So the question to your answer is to follow a more ecological path. Eco, not ego. We have to move from ego to eco. Only small change you are making from G to C. And but you make a quantum leap. So eco means relationship. The joy and fulfillment and delight of life is in relationship with nature, with your human family, and with yourself, with your soul, with your spirit. That is where fulfillment and joy and happiness and well-being reside. But consumerism, materialism, more desires, more you want to have, and then you bring shopping in your house and put it in the attic, and you never use it. That is, we are destroying the world and we are not being fulfilled. What's the point? That's the answer. Thank, Thank you. you once again, Satish. Thank you for being willing to answer so many questions uh, with so much passion and, and love. It's wonderful to have you here with us. And uh, Satish has already been asking about next year's visit, so uh, <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> um, and thank you also, everyone, for your questions. I'm sorry that we don't have time can, for, can say, for any more. Um, Andrew was saying yesterday that um, you are preaching to convert it. Uh, so if I come next time, you have to do a job. The job is to bring some people who are, you think, not yet in this ecological mindset or spiritual worldview. Bring people who are not familiar with these ideas. Could we want to spread the word and share these ideas and communicate and have a dialogue with all kinds of people. So if you want me to come again, bring some other people with you. Okay.